Today on Arts 24, one of the world's most prolific and successful children's writers who's penned more than 150 books. I'm Michael Morpurgo. I've written lots and lots of books. You might have heard of War Horse. You might have heard of Private Peaceful or The Butterfly Lion. His most famous novel, War Horse, became a global theatre phenomenon with more than 3,000 performances, not to mention being turned into a film by Steven Spielberg, starring Benedict Cumberbatch. He's in Paris to promote the film adaptation of Kensky's Kingdom, directed by these two. The story's a rare beast because it's something which is a fantastic adventure story for the whole family, but it also has a very timely ecological message. When I was a boy, my parents sold everything we had so they could take us on what they reckoned would be the trip of a lifetime sailing to the furthest corners of the world. It'll be the biggest adventure of your life, they said. They weren't wrong. Essentially, it's a story of an old man and a young boy sharing an island in the Pacific. I heard about 30 years ago the extraordinary story of a Japanese soldier from the Second World War who had been discovered on an island in the Pacific and he'd been living there for 27 years then since the end of the Second World War. He had decided to stay there because his home city of Nagasaki had been bombed. I mean, I was brought up on Robinson Crusoe and Treasure Island and these island stories. I live on an island that we all do in England. I wanted to have a story where there was this old Japanese man on an island and there was someone who came to discover him. And I wanted to be a young person of today. So I thought about it, and I went to a party. And I was talking to this man I hardly knew, and I said, you know, what do you do? What's your work? And this man said, well, we've been sailing around the world on a yacht. And I'm thinking, this is too good to be true. Dog, boy. And I said, did you go anywhere near the Pacific Islands? He said, yeah, we stopped off on them, lots of deserted islands. And so I decided, well, that was the story I wanted to write. 10,000 miles from home was where my adventure really began. <coughs> Lost and utterly alone. A boy and his dog on what we thought was a deserted island. I sort of analysed some of his books mm. and worked out that he, he always has a very, almost a bonkers premise. The idea is so elaborate that it's, it's unlikely to happen, like a horse-eye view of World War I, or, or a story where an English kid gets washed up on an island and there's an old Japanese soldier who's been living there. You, you think, well, that's implausible. That immediately triggers into your brain, well, I've got to, I want to find out how that works. So there's the hook. And that's just like a genius <laughs> um, you know, way of setting up all of your project. But this was Kensky's island. This was Kensky's kingdom. Several of your books have been adapted into films. War Horse in 2011, Private Peaceful in 2012, Waiting for Anya in 2020, among others. Is it true that this is the first one that you actually like? Yeah, but don't tell Steven Spielberg that. <laughs> yes, it is, really. I mean, the others, there are good things in all of them, lovely things in all of them, and I met lovely people doing it. But this is the first film I've been totally comfortable with. It catches the spirit of the book. It's ingenious, the way it grows from illustration. The music is wonderful. It's a very beautiful film. It's the most beautiful film I've ever had made, that's for sure. It's, it's the art of it, it's the acting, the voices, the writing of it. Frank Cottrell Boyce's writing is beautiful. And you've got some impressive actors doing the voices, including um, Oppenheimer, uh, Killian Murphy. Tell us about the choices of the actors. Well, Sarah Radcliffe, who was the original producer, she optioned the book. 20 years ago, so she always wanted to get Ken Watanabe from the beginning, you know, years ago, it was always going to be him. And then we had a re we did a discovered this kid, Aaron McGregor, mm. who was just an, a really, really incredible professional actor. I mean, I have to say, being a, a director is one of the best 
jobs you get is that you front row seats with these actors. They each need talking to in a different way or they need your reaction in a different way. It's a very different personality. Sally Hawkins, very, very intuitive, instinctive actor who, who would just dive right in emotionally. Ken Watanabe is very precise. You could actually almost say to Ken, can you just make that 10% angrier? And he would go and adjust it slightly and he, he could do that. Killian Murphy was, he was an interesting piece of casting because dad in the film could be a bit grumpy and so he could be a bit of an unlikable character if we, if we weren't careful. So we needed someone who was naturally warm and, and, and Killian just has this warmth. So even when he's sort of telling you off, you kind of think, oh, he's okay, he's a nice enough guy. And then Rafi Cassidy, an, an actress, I think, on the brink of sort of great stardom, who we needed to be Michael's slightly grumpy uh, sister. Why don't you come up here? Help me steer, all of us, together, exploring the world. Dolphins! Good go, Stella. It is bad out there. We need Somebody to get Stella to from our kennel. No! My God! One of the messages seems to be that we should work together despite our cultural differences, to protect the natural world. How would you describe the message and why is it relevant today? The example of Kensky is that he has learned to live simply, without waste, without ruining the environment, and in tune and in harmony with creatures around him. And this boy, of course, is amazed by it. He's never met such a person before. And because he's alone on this island with him, he has to live the same way. So he learns, and I think I'm very, very strong on the idea that children will be the ones to change this culture that we've got ourselves into. It's a culture of greed and consumption and all the stuff we know about, which has to change. In most stories, you expect the young child to learn from the old man, but as the story progresses, you realise that the old man needs to learn from the young boy just as much. And that's really the core message of the film, is that we all need each other, not just human to human, but we need to be respectful to the animals and to the environment. We are going to have to share this world. We can't keep grabbing pieces of it and killing each other to do it. The trouble is that we have a very poor grasp of history. I don't think we know where we come from. I don't think we know what we've done. Is that one of the reasons you think that you keep returning to yes. the First and Second World Wars in your Absolutely. stories? Absolutely. I mean, I grew up, I'm a war baby. I grew up in just after the Second World War. It's something we've got to come to grips with, is that this was not a time of great glory. This was not a time of our best moment. This is a time when we tried having an empire, and the other, world, other countries of Europe were having empires as well. Um, and there's a lot that was at best regrettable. So you have to acknowledge what's wrong before you can put it right. And I think what we might say to ourselves is, what's this got to do with the children growing up now? Well, they see it all the time. They see it on their television these flattened places in Gaza at the moment, and they can see the grieving when people are being buried. They can see it all. They don't necessarily take in the reasons, but they take in the fact that this is a sad, sad thing that's happening. And they have to understand why. So you have to know where it's all come from. What is the history? What's our connection with Jerusalem? What's our connection with the Arabs, with the Jews? The Holocaust, you have to know about it. You can't just say, oh, this horrible thing happened, forget about it. It's part of who we are, and one of the ways of doing it is to tell stories about it so that people feel that they are connected to it. Michael Morpogo's stories are just, and particularly this one, is just the ability to deliver that, what, you know, almost seems like a cliche to like, you know, that we, we, we've got to, you know, look past our differences and, and try and find our commonality. I mean, it's, it's almost a cliche, but it's just so beautifully delivered in, in, the, in the package of, of Kensky's Kingdom. One of the things that Neil and I are, are most pleased with with the film is how gentle it is. The, the cliche is cut fast, keep everything moving really fast because children don't have the attention exactly. span, but kids do if they're engaged yeah. in the story. And the children that we've shown this film to and that we've talked to afterwards get incredibly subtle details from the film. I mean, they understand it emotionally and they react to it. And it's, it's 
it does actually kind of fill you with hope as a person. You go, this next generation coming up are actually very bright and very smart, and hopefully the world is going to go in a, in a nicer direction. One of your most famous stories, of course, is War Horse, made into a film by Steven Spielberg uh, in 2011 after being a blockbuster theatre production with puppets. What do you make of that book's success, that story's success? Well, it was just great good fortune, really. It wasn't a success. It didn't sell very well. 800 copies in the first two years. But if you go and buy a copy of the first edition, one book, now is worth the same amount of money as I was given for writing the silly book in the first place. I mean, it's just stupid. That is because of, yes, the National Theatre's um, extraordinary play, and also the film that came afterwards, Steven Spielberg's film. It started that book with one translation, which was French, Gallimard. Bless them, I love the French for that. Then the film came out, and it now has 42 translations around the world. The book is the same book. It's just that this film was out there. It's huge. It's in many ways extraordinary. Uh, I don't like it as much as I like the film that's just been made um, of Kensky's The Kingdom. It misses something, whereas I think Kensky's Kingdom is the whole thing. One last question then. You recently published a book retelling um, Shakespeare's plays for oh, yeah. a young mm. audience. Mm. Which Shakespeare play do you think sums up the world we're living in today? Oh, for goodness sakes. There's always a whammy question at the end, isn't there? <laughs> it's probably King Lear, which is such an extraordinary study of power and vanity. That's pretty close to stuff going on today, isn't it? And war and cruelty to each other. But it's also a study of old age and madness. Michael Mopoga, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Speak to you. I understand now why you didn't want anyone to find you. <laughs> you have to stay and protect these guys. Between 2012 and 2014, the Syrian conflict spilled over into one of the biggest cities in Lebanon, Tripoli. <laughs> Symbolically divided by Syria Street, the Sunni and Alawite neighborhoods were plunged into a war that was not their own. Ten years later, an uneasy peace has returned, but deep scars remain. Watch Tripoli, Syria Street, Revisited, on France 24 and France24.com.